Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, it occurred to me that though I have been a long time subscriber of the channel History Dose, I've not to my knowledge ever done a reaction to one of their videos. And I thought this was a really good time to do that because Tuesday coming up, I'm going to be appearing on History Dose uh, to do a live stream chat where we're going to be asking each other some questions very similar to what I did with Mr. Beat a few weeks back. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to doing that and joining them for that. I, I've been friends with the, the, guy for, the guys for a while. Uh, we've talked here and there, but uh, first time we're going to be doing a little bit of a collaboration. So I'm excited about that. Uh, so we're going to take a look at their video today, Napoleon and the Battle of Trafalgar. We've been talking a lot about Napoleon lately because of the release of the movie. Uh, but we haven't talked about the naval battle, which doesn't directly involve Napoleon, but certainly impacted Napoleon and his ability to conduct his operations on land because of what happens at sea. And it makes the legend, cements the legend of Lord Nelson. So we're going to talk about that, that today. The link is in the description to the original commentary, uh, the, the original content, if you want to check it out without my commentary. Um, Definitely check them out. They're getting up toward a million subscribers. Hopefully this is the year that they hit that. I want to give it a shout out and a thank you to Cameron in Manhattan, Kansas, and Trent in Del Mar, Delaware. Thank you both so much for your support on Patreon. Couldn't do it without you. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. Real quick, my ancestry traces back all over the world. And with today's sponsor, My Heritage, I explored my Ooh, family sight. tree and discovered one ancestor's name pops up in the Salem Witch Trials. More on that and how you can use my heritage to discover your history toward the end of the video. It was on this coast in another age that the army of Julius Caesar departed to invade Britain. The same ambition has called Emperor Napoleon to these shores. Across 75 miles, he's arrayed over 100,000 men, whom he writes, are waiting only for a favorable wind in order to plant the Imperial Eagle on the Tower of London. Could you even imagine if that had actually happened? Napoleon does have command of this army, this army of England, as it's called, uh, with the express idea of invading the British Isles. And... Uh, what has protected the British all throughout their history has been the water, has been being an island nation. When other countries fall, it's their navy that protects them, and that's what's going to happen again. But the seas are patrolled by the Royal Navy, and the British have further blockaded much of the enemy French and Spanish fleets and harbors across Europe. Napoleon, as calculating and brave as he is brutal, devises a plan. He believes his fleets can slip the blockades in key ports, shake the British ships across the Atlantic, and sail into the English Channel to escort his invasion army. He declares, Let us be masters of the Channel for six hours, and we are masters of the world. And why does he say that? Because obviously he's not conquering the whole world. Well, for a good bit of the Napoleonic Wars, the only thing that stands in Napoleon's way is the British. They're funding uh, and fueling the wars of the coalition. When Napoleon's defeating the Austrians and the Prussians and the Italians uh, and all of these other nations, it's only the British who he just can't seem to get rid of. French Vice Admiral Villeneuve, pinned down in Toulon, breaks out with his fleet in the spring of 1805. It will be days before the British realize. The one who will chase him is the bane of the high seas himself, the dread of every French sailor. Vice Horatio Admiral Nelson. Horatio Nelson. In Nelson's heart burns a fervent love of king and country, a loyalty to old England, its heroes and traditions, and also its colonial iniquities. Admired by his enemies and lionized by his countrymen, Nelson fights in an age of great bloodshed. The old crowns of Europe rose to war years ago as France violently cast off its monarchy. And in time, they faced a dictator dressed in the language and promises of the late revolution. It's important to remember that, that many of these early wars of the coalition were not wars of conquest declared by Napoleon. These are wars 
declared by the other nations of Europe to put down the French and Napoleon because they have overthrown their monarchy. And there's the threat that that will spread to the other monarchies of Europe, and they don't want that. So they're trying to restore the Bourbons to the throne uh, because they don't want this to be something that they have to deal with in their own country. Napoleon has mastered the battlefield, but Nelson has mastered the seas. It was Nelson who smashed the French fleet during Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798. Nelson who triumphed at Copenhagen in 1801. He lost his arm in battle some years ago, and he will stop at nothing to eradicate the French fleet. Earlier writing, I would willingly have half of my fleet burnt to effect their destruction. Hmm. I am in a fever. God send we may find them. Nelson now approaches the West Indies, where Villeneuve has been reinforced with more Spanish and French ships. Having drawn the British out, Villeneuve will not wait for further reinforcements. He darts back across the Atlantic to the Spanish coast. After a foggy, inconclusive skirmish against some British warships, Villeneuve receives orders from the Emperor to sail into the Channel for the invasion of England. Sighting British warships, Villeneuve instead sails for Cadiz, where a British blockade promptly pins his fleet in the harbor. British blockades have for years deprived the French of supplies and naval experience. All the while, the British have bolstered their mighty fleet, manned by both volunteers and men conscripted through impressment. I know we sometimes can be tempted to overstate the importance of the British Navy. You know, rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves. But it's true. I mean, some of the most significant events of the last few hundred years have gone the way they have, specifically because of the Royal Navy. Think about if 1588, the Spanish Armada, isn't defeated by a smaller British Navy at that time. This is before the British are the dominant Navy on the seas. But that prevents a Spanish invasion that would have overthrown not only Queen Elizabeth, but Protestantism in England and potentially restored Catholicism and completely changed the trajectory of the British nation. Uh, of England, Scotland. Scotland's still a separate nation at this point and might have remained so in that scenario. Um, think about the First World War, which will come after this. Probably more than any other single event, the thing that keeps the Germans and the Central Powers from winning that war is the British blockade, the Allied blockade, specifically the British Navy blockading German ports, which is going to really have a, a substantial impact in bringing them to their knees. And, of course, the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the British Navy is really the decisive factor in turning things long-term against Napoleon. A practice whereby thousands of civilians, mostly those with seafaring experience, are seized by press gangs and forced into service, sons and fathers stolen away for years to come. The sailors are fed and paid, trained and brutally disciplined, and imbued with the fighting naval spirit of Britain. One of the prime factors in the War of 1812, why the United States will go to war against the British. The power of the Royal Navy notwithstanding, Napoleon cannot tarry while his admirals refuse to engage. To the east, the Austrians and Russians have begun to marshal their armies against him. So Napoleon has the invasion camps abandoned and leads his army to war. Outside Cadiz, Horatio Nelson arrives in his towering HMS Victory of over a hundred guns and assumes command of the British fleet. Villeneuve defies orders from Napoleon to break the blockade and sail into the Mediterranean. He will not risk battle until he learns that the Emperor has sent a Vice Admiral to replace him, a threat to his honor. And HMS Victory, which he mentions here as being Nelson's flagship, is still uh, the flagship of the first sea lord for the British. Uh, it's it's still commissioned. It is not afloat. So sometimes you'll hear uh, that the USS Constitution, uh, sometimes known as Old Ironsides, is the oldest commissioned warship afloat, which is true because it still sails. Uh, but it's much younger than HMS Victory. But HMS Victory is not a warship that is still taken out to sea. 
The morning of October 19th, the Franco-Spanish fleet sets out in the direction of Cape Trafalgar, and the British notice. Napoleon, in the midst of vanquishing the Austrian force at Ulm, still laments, Soldiers, we should this day have been in London. We should have mm. avenged ourselves for six centuries of insults and restored the freedom of the seas. Yeah, he makes a great point there, is that this is not new. The British and the French have been at each other's throats for centuries. They had just, I mean, the French had helped turn the tide of the American Revolution a couple uh, decades earlier than this. You had the Hundred Years' War. You've got Agincourt, and you've got all of these Cressy and all these really significant battles between the, Brit the English and the French and later the British and the French for centuries. Beknownst to him, the battle for the ocean is about to begin. The morning of the 21st, Nelson bears down on the Franco-Spanish fleet. The British are outnumbered. 27 ships of the line to 33, 17,000 men to 30,000. But the British are far better trained, and Nelson has long planned this day. Rather than line up and fire at range, which would allow his foes to escape if needed, Nelson plans to charge in two columns, splitting the staggered enemy line in three parts and allowing his gun crews to thrive in destructive chaos. Now, looking at that map, you would think, well, lo logically speaking, what do you typically talk about when we're talking about this era is crossing the T. You want to be where the French are, which is sailing this way, where you've got your broadsides that can rake down the long, less armored parts of this ship. And by armored, I mean thick wood at this point. We're not talking about steel or iron or anything. Um, so theoretically, this is what you want. But Nelson's got a plan, and this is where it shows how sometimes numbers and, and guns don't always help you. Nelson is to the sea what Napoleon is on land. He can win a battle like this. Nelson leads the northern column in the victory, while Vice Admiral Collingwood leads the southern column in the Royal Sovereign. Interesting that Collingwood is the guy here because I didn't really know much about the origin of the name Collingwood, but in World War I, 100 years later, uh, the future King George VI is going to serve at the Battle of Jutland aboard the HMS Collingwood. The wind in their sails is faint, so the approach is a long drift. Bands play patriotic tunes, hours pass. And when every gun, rope, and sail is in place, all the men can do is wait like beasts to the slaughter. By signal flags, Nelson relays the message. England expects that every man will do his duty. Mm. At a thousand yards out, the French and Spanish guns heavily bombard the leading British ships. Jeez, that's a half a mile. Sails tear, beams crack. Angled forward, the British lack an effective way to return fire. This is this requires a lot of, of guts, a lot of hardcore, steely-eyed resolve uh, to go into the French broadsides like that. The French have hundreds of guns pointed at you and you can't really return fire all that well because you're pointed at them. They've got your T crossed. In order to affect your plan, you've got to weather that storm to get into position. Not an easy ask of these crews. Most men simply take cover. The 16 year old English boy in his first battle sees a comrade's head shot away and writes, my ears rang with the shrieks of the wounded and the moans of the dying. Collingwood breaks the line first and smashes a broadside into a Spanish ship. Mm. The massacre begins. In the north and like Nelson's I said, this is where if you can get through that ste that hail of, of lead, right, to where you can finally start breaking through their formations, now you can start returning fire. But you've got to get there first. Three approaches under a barrage of several ships including Villeneuve's French flagship and the massive Spanish Santissima Trinidad, a four-decker with 136 guns. Nelson stands unflinching on the quarterdeck. A shot smashes the wheel, from then on forcing 40 men to steer the victory from below by verbal commands. Wow. Next to Nelson, Secretary Scott is blown in half by a cannonball. At last, the victory breaks the line behind Villeneuve's ship. Double and triple shotted guns blast one and a half tons of iron into the French stern, mm. instantly killing and maiming hundreds of Villeneuve's crew. 
The victory then comes alongside the French 74-gun Redoutable. Guns thunder in the choking air. Under no illusions about matching rapid British cannon fire, the French have packed their ships with infantry. We now unleash musket fire and grenades on the victory's upper deck. A French marksman shoots down Horatio Nelson. Nelson collapses, announces that his backbone is shot through, and he's carried below decks. At the, the moment of great victory, I mean, in, in all the annals of British naval history, what are the two battles that first come to people's minds? The Spanish Armada in 1588 and the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. And here you have the, the admiral who leads it killed before the victory is even won. But I'm just trying to put myself in the mindset of, of a sailor on one of these ships. The, the chaos, the smoke, the violence, the explosions and the death and the blood and the splinters all around you. How a person could keep their wits about them in the middle of this chaos, uh, that's, who, that's what determines who wins. The crew of the shorter Redoutable then lowers the main yard and begins to board the victory with swords, hatchets, and pistols. Mm. But a British ship comes to the aid of the victory and fires a terrible broadside into the Redoutable. Let me just take a minute here and say well done to the guys at History Dose for the presentation of this. This is actually my first time watching one of their videos. I've been subscribed for a while, but I, I typically don't watch videos I might react to because I want it to be fresh and I'm reacting, seeing it for the first time. Uh, so well done. Really, really great presentation of all of this. It, it's fantastic. Masts of both ships crash down as the cannons continue. The French decks are strewn with dripping entrails and screaming mm. sailors. The captain records 522 casualties out of a crew of just over 600. Jeez. Really, I know of nothing on board that had not been hit by shot. In the midst of this horrible carnage and devastation, my splendid fellows who had not been killed kept cheering, Long live the Emperor. Jeez. The battle all around has morphed into clusters of ships exchanging fire. The wounded are carried down to the dark and groaning lower decks, where surgeons saw off mangled limbs and tend to the wretched and the dying. All while the fire is still going on around them. I mean, there's a great chance that you as the surgeon are likely to be hit as well. It's not like in the military on land where you might be far behind the lines. I mean, everywhere is a target on a ship. In the belly of the victory, Horatio Nelson has lost all feeling below his chest. Certain of his own demise, he instructs the surgeon to direct his attention to the other wounded. Mm. Nelson can hear the crew above him cheer with each enemy ship captured, and a brief visit from his friend, Captain Thomas Hardy, provides him with updates on the battle. A route looks certain as the day wears on. The British encircle and pummel their targets, while enemy ships that have turned to engage from the north make only a half-hearted attack. Hardy goes down again to see Lord Nelson, and informs him that victory is at hand, that the British have not lost a ship, and 14 or 15 enemy vessels have surrendered. Nelson strains, that is well, but I bargained for 20. Uh, After some last geez. words, Hardy- the Man is dying. And he's unhappy with the level of the victory at this point. He wants more. Kisses his friend on the cheek and then the forehead. God bless you, Hardy, Nelson says. And thereafter, he repeats the phrase, Thank God I have done my duty. <laughs> Horatio Nelson dies sometime after four o'clock. Upon hearing of his death, British sailors and captains alike will sob openly. Mm. As the sun begins to set, a fire aboard the French ship Achille reaches the magazine. The brilliant eruption and the last bellow of the drowning ship signal the imminent end of the Battle of Trafalgar. The ocean teems with splinters and sail, limbs and corpses thrown overboard, and treading survivors gasping for rescue. What a scene! British that must dead have been. and wounded number around 1,700. 
while the French and Spanish count roughly 7,000, with an equal number taken prisoner. While some have managed to flee, over half of the Franco-Spanish fleet is captured, to be taken as British prizes. The Spanish and French, both of Catholic tradition, keep all their dead on board for a proper burial on land. One 16-year-old British sailor boards the Santissima Trinidad and writes, She had between three and four hundred killed and wounded. Her beams were covered with blood, brains, and pieces of flesh. The Can you even imagine the scene of carnage after this battle? We think about the bloodiness of land battles, but I, I feel like these significant battles at sea had to have been even worse because they're confined spaces. And you have the, the artillery combined with, I mean, it's not artillery in the same sense, but um, combined with the splintering of wood and destruction of uh, just anything that's on these ships that could be sent across. And everything's done at such close range that the devastation and the destruction to human bodies must have been overwhelming. French and Spanish recapture a few vessels. Several more are lost as a dark hurricane thrashes the bleeding ships for the next week. A French sailor witnesses survivors of the battle wreck against the coast. The wounded were shrieking. When the tide was out, they dragged themselves along on those limbs that were not maimed and sought to avoid the death that they found further on. Franco-Spanish naval power is shattered, as are Napoleon's future plans of invading Britain. In England, celebration of the triumph at Trafalgar is stifled by the grave loss of the people's hero, slain in the hour of victory. The Look grieving public will watch the procession of Nelson's regal state funeral, an affair decorated by flags captured at Trafalgar and attended by the prisoner of war, Villeneuve. What a scene that must have been. I mean, because just the... the art of the scene is amazing uh, and of course he's buried at saint paul's cathedral um powerful powerful stuff villeneuve returns to france in the spring by means of a prisoner swap napoleon has suppressed news of the defeat at trafalgar but villeneuve is nonetheless disgraced in embarrassment to the emperor Shortly after his return, Villeneuve is found dead in a hotel room. Officials point to a final note and maintain that he died by his own hand. But the cause of death is six stab wounds to the lung and one to the heart. And naturally, questions linger. Oh, he was murdered. Trafalgar has I'm curious about the details of that. Seems like most people still say it was suicide, but man, f five stab wounds? I don't know. I don't know if anybody would choose to do it that way. Why not a, a gun? I don't know. People are pointing to the the note that he left for his wife as proof, but there's a lot of ways that note could have come about that might not have involved him intentionally doing that. Who knows if it was a situation where they came to him and said, you're going to write this note and we're going to take you out but we'll make sure that your family's taken care of. Kind of similar to what happened with Rommel during World War II. I don't know. Seems fishy to me. Did ...lasting British dominance over the seas, but Napoleon soon after brilliantly crushed his enemies on land at the Battle of Austerlitz and forced the final dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. Napoleon grows in power, and the war for Europe continues. Pretty fascinating how uh, right at about the same time that uh, this great British victory at Trafalgar happens, Napoleon's going to win arguably his greatest victory at Austerlitz uh, at the same during the same year. So interesting stuff. And this all happens, of course, within a short time after Napoleon has even become emperor in the first place. So really interesting and really, really well done by the guys at History Dose. I, I enjoyed that a lot. Fantastic presentation. Like I said, check out their channel in the link uh, below in the description. It'll take you to their videos and you can see everything for yourself. And I will post the details uh, of my chat with them that'll be over on their channel on Tuesday. Uh, so be watching for that and be watching as well later today for an announcement video with some information about meetups in the UK uh, and some other things that you can be a part of that are coming up uh, in the next few months. Thanks for watching.